Your Steve Jones Show podcast is loading now. The Steve Jones Show podcast is sponsored by Sunbury Motors, North 4th Street in Sunbury, and Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. Sports talk where your voice counts. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Now from the Sunbury Motor Studio, here's Steve Jones. Good afternoon, Steve Jones Show, News Radio 1070 WKOK. We are at stevejonesshow.com. You can also subscribe to our podcast. We are on iTunes, Apple Podcast app, and Google Play. Search Steve Jones Show. And we drop the shows right to your smartphone and tablet. You can listen to them anytime, anywhere. And also three months of shows. You can always find them at stevejonesshow.com. And look who uh, found himself here into the Sunbury Motor Studio, our great friend Bob Buner. Hey, Bob. Hey, Sean. Good afternoon. Uh, we've got lots going on in the world of sports. Uh, right now we've got a Bucknell basketball game down in Orlando, Florida, I believe. Yeah, they've been part of the uh, NIT pre-tournament, and uh, they got the win yesterday over Seattle uh, by a score of 77-70, to and they're now at the half. It was actually the team that uh, Penn State just beat by only two points on last Saturday yeah. at the Jordan Center. Uh, Yale is up by 20 over Bucknell, 43-23. to 23. That game is currently live on Eagle 107. Uh, Bucknell, the last couple of days, have been down in Orlando at the ABC Wide World of Sports Complex. So Bucknell is going to go from Yale to another Ivy League team. Princeton will be in Central PA. They'll be at Soika coming up on Saturday to take on the Orange and Blue. Around 2 o'clock in the afternoon, if I'm not mistaken. That is a 1.30 airtime, of course, on Eagle 107. And we'll get to hear the melodic voice of Doug Bird's song. Doing we will. All, doing we will. a little play-by-play we, from the Soika. We're catching a little bit of... Uh, we were catching a little bit of Doug here on the Eagle 107 broadcast before we went on air, and they're looking to uh, pop some threes before heading into halftime. And that has been a great MO for the Orange and Blue here in the early part of the season. I go back a couple of weeks ago to the Hofstra game where they were shooting literally lights out. Th- a three-point shooting, they were close to 60%. But you can live by the three and die by the three. And, you know, they died by the three recently. They missed the, the Bison 25 consecutive three-pointers going from the Syracuse game to the Seattle game. Not a, a formula for victory. Yeah, they had a. Uh, it was a tough road to hoe at Penn State. Ooh, yeah, tough road to hoe at Syracuse. But the Making thing is, though, work here. It's, <laughs> <laughs> but it's those games that Bucknell is involved with, guys. That it's only going to help them when they get into January, when the Patriot League starts to kick in. Yeah, absolutely. Right, and that, but this is what we talk about all the time. That's why they schedule it the way they schedule it, because they know darn well, no matter what they do in in this part of the year, it's not going to be good enough to get them anywhere. Uh, so you you do it to play the best competition. That way, iron sharpens iron before you get to the part that really, really counts for you, and that's the Patriot League. That's going to be the part that gets you in. Bucknell is never going to get an at-large bid. Simple as that. I mean, it's, you know... I mean, don't mean to be blunt. No, but it's just a, it's, it's called a fact of life. You know, Steve, a few years ago, uh, when Lehigh won the Patriot League and went on to defeat a, a good Duke team, I think they were third. Duke was third seeded, and Bucknell had Mescala, who's still in the NBA. Joe Willman, uh, Bryson yeah. Johnson. They still didn't get an at-large bid, and they were certainly one of the top 64 teams in the country. But it's the Patriot League. They look at it and they pull somebody else's name out of the hat. Well, here's the difference. And I'll be okay. Yeah, let's have a frank conversation sure. about this. Because a lot of people get too too emotional and and don't have frank conversations about things. Minnesota football is a good example. Minnesota football played Penn State beat them. Now they had not played a very good schedule until they played Penn State. Okay, what did Minnesota football do the next week when they went to Iowa? 
they didn't win. Because suddenly, for the first time this season, it wasn't the fact that they were undefeated going to Iowa. That That's that's irrelevant to this conversation. It was the first time all season they had to play teams of that caliber back-to-back. When you look at what Penn State football's done, you play at Iowa. Okay, great. Now the next week you play Michigan. Okay, great. Then you play at Michigan State. Okay, great. Then you play at Minnesota. Okay, great. Then you play Indiana. Okay, great. Then you play at Ohio State. So in a span of six games, you play five ranked teams, and the sixth one was ranked in the opening month of the season. When you have to do that on a week-in and week-out basis, there is a grind to that. That's why when you look at a group of five team, oh, look at UCF, oh, they should be in the national champion. No, they shouldn't, okay, because they don't have to play that, right? One week you're playing East Carolina, okay, then you're playing Tulane, then you got your big game with Memphis, okay, that's great. Well, that for a program like Bucknell, I'm sorry, but playing Lafayette one one game, then Lehigh's really good. Okay, Colgate's really good, but then you play Holy Cross, then you play Navy, then right. You don't get that grind of game in and game out. I mean, Penn State's opening two games in the Big Ten in basketball in two weeks will be at Ohio State and then home with Maryland. Okay. Yep. They seem to know how to play basketball in Maryland and at I'm, Ohio State. I'm just saying it's the it is the absolute game in and game out grind where you don't get the okay, you can breathe a little bit this week. That doesn't happen. And that's why a group of five team and that's why a Patriot team or a Southern Conference team or whatever the champion gets in, and that's usually it because there's not that game by game by. It's a game by game grind to the Patriot, but not to the level of, okay, let's go to Columbus and play Ohio State. All right, let's come home and play Maryland. Okay, let's go back on the road and play Michigan State and Tom Izzo. Let, okay, now let's go back on the road again, and now let's get Illinois, which is on the rise. Okay, now you got to come back home. Oh, good, finally back home. Oh, we got Wisconsin. Uh, that, that see, there's a big difference there. Oh, no question. I, I mean, that's just way, the way it is. I mean, everybody gets caught in emotion. UCF football, they should be playing for the national championship. Oh, they proved it. Look, they beat Auburn. Please cut me a break. Right? You don't have to play. Okay, let's take Auburn. Auburn had a chance to get into the college football playoff. They lost to Georgia after beating Georgia two weeks earlier. Right, you think they're emotionally ready to play UCF? UCF, it's their Super Bowl. Auburn's like, oh god, we got to play UCF. All right, and you know, just because they can win a game does not mean that you know they've gone through the marathon. You got, I mean, Auburn had to play Alabama, had to play Georgia twice. Had to play, you know, had to play Texas A&M. Had to play LSU. Did UCF have had to play any of those teams, especially consecutively? No. And that's, it's the grind of it, of having to play quality teams all the time, that really gets into an attrition grind physically, and also the grind of every week you've got to be up to play the next game. As opposed to, hey, great, we got Tulane today. Yep, de dip de doo. Right. But you know, Steve, the counter argument to that, let's take Boise State uh, a few years ago. And they It's you the know, same story, but Bob, they play one game. And then they go to a bowl game and they take uh, the snot right out of a good Oklahoma team. So there's my point is that is the exception to the rule, but that's what causes the fan uh Reaction to why isn't Boise State in the national championship? Things like that. I think it's that exception to the general rule when you have an upset, say, Bucknell in basketball beating oh, Kansas or Syracuse right. or Arkansas, etc. They're they're really it has nothing to do with being really good teams. It has nothing to do with that. Steve, I remember it the has, story. It has it has to do with the grind of how many big games you have to play in a season to get there. And it's again, you're not. I mean, the Pac-12 may be down, but did Boise State have to play USC, UCLA, Washington, Oregon, or you know, uh, Arizona State? No, no. 
Okay, they don't. They don't have to do that. They have to win. You can only play who's in front of you. Yep. But in the end, when you're looking at the resume, you can get up. Houston can get up and win the Peach Bowl over Florida State, which they did. Yep. Boise State can get up and win a game against. It doesn't mean they're not good teams, but they're not battle tested enough over. Two months. I remember that story, of Steve. You, conference play. I remember you, that story you shared with us a couple of years ago when you uh, when you talked to the play by play voice of Wisconsin, and it was right around early. It was around early December, mid to de- mid December, when they found out who they were going to play for their bowl game, and it turns right. out it was the at large. Team. Western Michigan. It was yeah. Western it was, Michigan it, going it, it into that PG, New Year's P- New Year's Six game, yeah. and and it just you're right, it just doesn't have the pop and sizzle. And Bob and I were kind of talking, yeah. and, and 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 I know this was a uh, go ahead, Bob. I'm no, not going to steal no, your thunder. No, go, go, ahead. go right ahead. This yeah. was the burning question you were going to ask Steve about his vacation. Well, not his yeah. vacation plans. The, oh, the qu- the question, Steve, that I had, and this is um, part of this show we call the Ask Steve segment. Where will you be spending New Year's Eve, New Year's Day? If you needed to call a travel agent today, <laughs> uh, well, I, a lot. It's going to start this weekend as to where it's going to be. Sure. Number one, number one. Let's start with this. I mean, I take nothing for granted. Got to beat Rutgers. Now, Penn State's the prohibitive favorite and should be. Yeah. All right. So that that's one. So that gets you to ten wins. Now you do need Ohio State to beat Michigan. Okay. Then you do need Wisconsin to beat Minnesota. And then the net last part is if all if those boxes are checked, then you need Ohio State to beat Wisconsin. I think you need Ohio if, if, State if, to if, decisively win those two games because that's no, going to make last Saturday's no. no, no, no. Okay, no, no. They just have to win. Okay, all right. Because if they win, they're in the college football playoff. That would have thought point margin then would make Penn State's no. uh, result last Saturday a lot uh, more better compared. Yeah, you know, when no, it comes to the that, New Year's no. six games shaking out. No, okay, that doesn't that doesn't enter into it. So what, you, would, what, what would enter into it is is that Penn State right now the data points really favor Penn State. Strength of schedule, strength of wins. Uh, Penn State is in the top ten in strength of schedule and wins on data points. I believe they well maybe on strength of schedule might be fifteen maybe, but their strength of wins are seven, uh, and and so on data points they would really be helped. See what would happen: Ohio State beating Michigan gives Michigan a third loss, so yeah, they're, they're, they're okay, out. El, right eliminated. Okay. Uh, Wisconsin winning gives Minnesota the second loss. And not only that, it would be their second loss finally against the meat of their schedule. All right. Which then brings us to Ohio State and Wisconsin playing the Big Ten championship game. And Ohio State winning it gives Wisconsin its third loss. All right. That then propels Ohio State into the college football playoff. And if, if those, if those th- uh, four things happen, actually it'll be five. Penn State wins. Ohio State wins, Wisconsin wins, and then that Ohio State wins again. So four things happen. I think Penn State has a shot at being in Pasadena. And, Steve, who makes that selection? Assume the scenario that you just described occurred, and we know Ohio State, which would normally go to the Rose Bowl if there was no national championship, um, then who makes that call? The Rose, Rose Bowl B- Committee? Rose Bowl Committee makes it. You know, okay. they, they, and it has to be... There have to be uh, certain criteria met to get there. Um, they, there's obviously the Minnesota story is a great story, and they may travel very, very well. Penn State, by the way, just racked up a 6.8 rating in its game against Ohio State, which is the second highest TV rating of the year behind LSU Alabama. That stands out, too. Uh, sure. But I think those are the four things I'm looking to see. If those four things happen, I think the door is open. Now, other now other doors, uh, they can't go back to the Citrus Bowl because they went there last year. Right. Right, and they're trying to keep teams from not going to the same place twice. So that means the Outback Bowl becomes a possibility. It is not out of the realm of possibility that the Orange Bowl, which is obligated to take uh, three Big Ten teams over a six- or seven-year span – that's not out of the realm of possibility either. But I still say the Rose Bowl is in play if that four-game scenario falls into play. And by the way, in each one of the four games I talked about, each team is the favorite. Right. So that's, I mean, that's what I'm looking at here right now with this. 
Uh, you know, first things first, got to play Rutgers. Uh, and it's got all oh, Rutgers. Look, I take nothing for granted. No, nothing. I go in. I go in with a blank slate. I know Penn State is the absolute prohibitive favorite. There's no question about it. There's no doubt who the more talented team is. Uh, you know, but you still have to play the doggone game. So then after that, uh, Minnesota's. Remember, last year Minnesota won at Wisconsin. Minnesota won at Wisconsin. Uh, which is interesting. Uh, but Wisconsin's better this year, especially defensively. They're better. Uh, and it's going to be all about them running the football. Ohio State and Michigan, let's give Michigan credit. They played really, really well. But Ohio State, I think, is a different level. Uh, you know, after seeing the two teams in person, it's obvious to me which one is the better team, even though the game's in Ann Arbor. Do you think that there will be a letdown by the Buckeyes coming off that win that they had uh, sat last Saturday? They spend one practice period every single week on Michigan. <laughs> no, no, I'm not, I understand. I'm not kidding I mean, th- this No, they spend one practice period. I'm sorry. There's a practice period every day, I mean, not week. Every day there is one practice period that's called the Michigan period. That they sit there and they they work on that. Uh, that um, you know when you're playing, look, it's not even even that. It doesn't really matter if they're playing Michigan. Okay, you are playing. These are all playoff games for Ohio State. You are playing in a playoff to try and win the national championship. So right now, Ohio State is in a three-game playoff. Okay, they they start out with a four-game. Ohio State starting last week was in a four-game playoff to get to the national championship game. So they won over Penn State. That's one. Playoff game number two was Michigan. Playoff game number three would be Wisconsin. Playoff game number four would be the semifinal. So they're they're right now in game two of a four-game playoff to get to the national championship game. Let down? Okay, Uh, we'll come back with more in a moment here on News Radio 1070 WKOK, brought to you by Sunbury Motors. Brewers Outlet, Brewers Outlet, Brewers Outlet, Jenny 1195, Jenny 1195, Jenny 1195, Brewers Outlet, Brewers Outlet, Jenny 1195, Jenny 1195. Now that's what I'm talking about. Brewers Outlet has Genesee, Jenny Light, and Ice 30 pack cans for just 1195. Get it? We got it. Pickles, ice, cigars, lottery, and all your beverage and party needs are a one stop shop at the beverage supermarket, Brewers Outlet, Reagan Street, Sunbury. Taking your calls at 800-795-9565. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Now from the Sunbury Motor Studio, here's Steve Jones. Buner's in the building. Uh, by the way, Buner, you get Buner gets a lot of run. By the way, on Friday, have you noticed that? That's right. He sure does. Well, he's going back to check on Kevin the suit her, making sure he's okay. Why? <laughs> Someone cares for the guy. We do too. We're busy. We're here doing the heavy lifting and t- taking care of the show. So, sure. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I ask you, are the jokes that easy? Some days they are, yes. Yeah. (laughs) Tee them up. Let it fly. Grip and rip it. I mean, I mean, we we care deeply. Uh, Yes. Sure. Uh, Sure. I can't stand those two guys. <laughs> I don't care yeah. how much of the lo- I don't care how much of the load they carry. Yes, you do. <laughs> can't live without us. <laughs> oh boy, never true a word spoken. All right, so uh, <laughs> uh, tomorrow's show, by the way, will be from Brooklyn, and Friday's show will be from. Brooklyn. Yeah. <laughs> and Thanksgiving will be in Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> no sleep till Brooklyn. Uh, no, in fact, uh, we'll be spending Thanksgiving a few blocks away from where Joe Paterno grew up. So <laughs> uh, the hotel's right next to Flatbush. 
So, all right. James Franklin met with the media today. Now, this will be the first part. This is not the part I think most people do know. Justin Shorter has put his name into the transfer portal. Uh, Pete Thamel uh, is the one that reported that earlier today. James uh, has had a conversation with him. I will tell you that Justin Shorter did practice on Sunday night. Portal is always a step. It is not final. Last I checked, our defensive player of the game for Penn State was in the portal last January and decided to come back, Lamont Wade, and has turned in a really outstanding season. And Cam Sullivan Brown came back. Others left. So the transfer portal's there, but it also doesn't mean it's final either. So let's just see how that plays out. But James had his press conference earlier today. Here are some of his thoughts on what's going on at Penn State, but also on Rutgers. Getting into Rutgers, you look at uh, Nunzio Campanelli, uh, who is leading the program right now, serving as both the interim head coach and interim offensive coordinator. Uh, Returned 15 starters coming into the season. Uh, on the offensive side of the ball, um, I've known Coach Campanelli for a long time. It was a head high school coach at Bergen Catholic, did a phenomenal job, is really doing a phenomenal job right now at Rutgers under some tough situations, obviously. Um, you know, but obviously being a guy from the state takes a lot of pride in the state university and, and being a high school coach is, is doing a great job. I look forward to seeing him before the game. You know, scheme, they're predominantly 11 and 12 personnel. Use multiple, uh, you know, personnels, uh, groups and formations out of, out of those things. Uh, 72% run on normal downs. They're a power read team, a zone, a zone read team, and they also run the stretch. Guys that we're impressed with. On offensive line, Kamal Seymour, offensive lineman, number 54, young man out of Brooklyn, New York, that that we recruited, um, I guess, five years ago. I remember sitting in a white castle, I think, in, in Bronx with uh, with Coach Spencer and trying to, to recruit Kamal. He's done a really nice job. I'm very happy for him. Their quarterback, number 17, Johnny Langan. Um, the running back, you know, really jumps out the, off the tape. He has done that the last couple of years. Number one, Isaiah Pacheco, uh, really runs hard, as fast, as explosive. And then Bo, Bo Melton, a young man that we recruited as well from New Jersey, he's doing a nice job for them. Uh, his father played at Rutgers as, as well. Um, you look on the defensive side of the ball, uh, Andy Bue, um, 22 years uh, coaching experience. Uh, now at Rutgers was at Maryland before that with with Coach Bowen. Um, you know they're a base four down defense. They will mix in some some three down front and and the old bear front as well. Uh, they're going to play a combination of, of quarters coverage, what we call cover four, cover one as well. Um, guys that we've been impressed with is is number twenty two. Their defensive back Damon Hayes, uh, young man out of Upper Marlboro, Maryland. Uh, D lineman number ninety six. Uh, Willing, uh, Willington Prevelian, if I'm saying his name correct, um, I hope so. Uh, big young man, six foot five, two hundred ninety-five pounds, out of Orange, New Jersey, and then a linebacker that we re- recruited as well out of Baltimore, uh, Tyshawn Fogg, uh, number eight, is doing a really good job for them. Uh, if you look at special teams, uh, Vince Ocruz has been, you know, in this league and and doing it for a long time. He's forty-second year coaching veteran. Has uh, been at Rutgers now for for a number of years. Was at Ohio State before that. A uh, guy that we're very familiar with and got a lot of respect for. Their punter, um, you know, is probably having as productive of a year as anybody on their team. Is averaging almost 44 yards a punt and um, is a Ray Guy finalist. I think the thing that really jumps out, maybe not his his national rank in terms of yards, but how many times he's pinning people deep inside his own 10 yard line. Uh, also, defensive back, number 29, Lawrence Stevens, shows up for them on special teams, doing a great job. And then wide receiver, number 13, Prince Taylor, as well. Um, so that's kind of where we are. Um, I wanted to make sure I covered those things with you. Uh, the weather is beautiful today. Um, I hear it's going to be very similar on Saturday. <laughs> Maybe not so much. Um, but I, I get, like always, uh, it's been a long season. I appreciate you guys coming out and covering Penn State the way you, way you do. Uh, and we open up the questions. 
Start with Richard Scarcella, Reading Eagle. Good afternoon, James. How are you? What role have your fifth-year seniors played in um, molding the culture and creating the bond within your locker room, and what will you remember most about them? Yeah, you know, it's it's really kind of amazing when you think about, you know, five years and the impact that guys can have, and those guys specifically uh, on a team, you know, on a locker room, on a coaching staff, uh, and really on a, on a community, you know. Um, you know, as you guys know, five years ago where the program was compared to where it is now, um, you know, is, is dramatically different. You know, and I think you guys have heard me talk about that I don't know if that story is talked about enough, you know. Um, and the reality is those guys and guys like them, you know, the guys that were fifth-year seniors before that, um, they, they're owed most of the credit. You know, they, they really are. You know, uh, they committed to Penn State at a time um, that maybe it, was, it wasn't as easy as of a decision to commit to Penn State. Um, you know, they've battled through adversity. Um, you know, they've, they've, they've been phenomenal. So um, it's, it's really hard to kind of sit here and, and put into words uh, what they have meant to this program, what they have meant to me personally. Um, you know, I think for Thanksgiving, as you guys know, we, 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 we try to do a great job with Thanksgiving and make sure everybody's supported and loved. And I think I got 26 players and families coming to my house um, on Thursday. Um, and I'd love for all of them to be there because, you know, um, I only got so much time left with them, you know. So um, it's, it's really hard to express, um, you know, what, what those guys have, have, have meant to our program, to our university, and to our community. Derek Lavars, Wilkes Bear Times leader. Hi, James. How are you? Good, Derek. How are you? I'm doing well, James. James, what can you tell us about uh, Sean Clifford's availability for Saturday, and and how, how do you manage reps in practice when you have a quarterback banged up? I mean, you try and get more first team snaps for for Will than usual this week, or, or how do you find that balance? Yeah, I know you guys hate to hear this, but it, it, it it'll be a game time decision. Um, it's really probably magnified this week but it's been a little bit like this for the last three four weeks with him um you know i really could see a situation where will plays this week now how much he plays I, i'm not sure um but i could see us you know playing will this week um and will's gonna have to get you know a little bit more reps in practice just because you know sean's not ready to take the normal amount of reps that he normally would so um, that also changes it for 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 Michael and and Taquan as well. So, um, but it'll be you know it'll be a um, kind of we'll we'll follow uh, you know medical recommendations like we always do on what they're able to do today and what he's able to do tomorrow and then um, you know between what the doctors and trainers and what Sean says. Uh, will we'll factor into it. I, I will tell you, Sean's not the easiest guy, just like Trace wasn't, to pull off the field. Um, you know, they're, they're competitors. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, you know, uh, th those will be medical decisions. Mark Wilgen, Rich Allen, Tom Morning Call. Hi, James. How are you? Good, Mark. How are you? Good, thanks. Um, earlier today, Blake Gilligan on his conference call said he thought you were outside of the football building. He thought you were underappreciated. Do you feel that way? Do you feel outside of your building that maybe you're underappreciated? You, you specifically as a head coach. Oh, me? Yeah. My, yeah, my wife thinks so. You know, but, but about that, that's the only person I really hear from um, is, is my wife, you know, and, and the coaches and the staff. And my daughters come to practice a lot. You know, I, I will tell you this, you know, um, I think being a football coach and being in the, in the building, um, it's like being in a submarine, and I think there's positives to that because it, it, you get insulated from a lot of things. Um, the, the social media and the phones and stuff like that um, change that and kind of bring that world within the submarine, but only if you choose to. You don't, you don't, have, to, you don't have to look at your phone. Um, 
Uh, the players is is really my concern you know they have to be out on campus and walking around on campus and my daughters have to go to school and and all those types of things so my concern is always for others um that that's that's kind of how i'm wired um you know how blake feels and and how other people feel you know i'm I'm not sure um i'm getting to a point where i'm getting older where um, I'm not one of these guys that can tell you that I don't care what other people think. I do. I do. I, I, I care deeply what other people think. Um, but I am probably getting to a point where um, I'm pretty confident. Um, it, the, if you look at, at what we've done since we've been here, <clears throat> there's a lot to be proud of. And everybody, everybody should... Um, should feel that way uh, the trainers the doctors the players the, the coaches uh, the media um, that covers Penn State football the fans the people in the community we, you know the season ticket holders the students they should always feel really proud because everybody had a part in it um, but you know I, I'm pretty confident I'm pretty confident in, in, in what we've been able to do in, in, in helping guys reach their dreams academically, athletically, socially. Um, our record stacks up pretty good against pretty much anybody. Um, so you know we're in a good place. I'm in a good place. I want to get better. We want to get better. Um, I appreciate that I got a fifth year punter sticking up for the head coach, but um, you know, we're we're in, we're in a pretty good place, and the, and the the people that matter most, Fumi, Addy, and Shola, and the guys in the locker room, you know, they're they're the guys that that I'm I'm most concerned about. Frank Bodani, your daily record. Hi, James. Hey, Hope Frank. You enjoy your Thanksgiving. Thank you. You too, Frank. With your team, what do you think would be one area that you might be uh, you think has made the most improvement, most growth since the beginning of the season? maybe something in particular yeah you know that that that's that's a good question um i you know i i guess you'd have to say it's hard for me to do this because i'm always looking at things critically you know the staff gets on me that i need to you know focus on the positives more and i see myself as a positive guy but i'm also a critical guy in terms of i'm always on to the next task um but I'd probably say, you know, at the quarter, quarterback position in Sean, is I just think coming into the season, no one knew what to expect. So that, that would probably be the thing that jumps out to me. And then obviously, you know, Levis being able to come in and do some good things under a tough situation. Um, so I'd probably say that position in, in, in some ways, although I know we need to get better and need to spread the ball around more and, and increase our completion percentage, all those types of things. But I would probably say, probably say that. Joe Giuliano, Philadelphia Inquirer. Hey, James, how are you? Good, Joe, how are you? I just wanted to uh, ask a uh, specific question about uh, two of your fifth-year seniors. Um, Nick Bowers, uh, who played, I think, 12 games in his four years prior to this year, will be playing in his 12th game Saturday. And the other is um, Steven Gonzalez, who went from a third-string left guard to a guy who's made, like, 41 career starts. What have you seen in the development of both of those young men? You know, I, I think they're two really good examples. I mean, you know, Bowers is a young man that that you know we're really excited about as a as a freshman and doing some great things. And he gets an injury, and he second guesses things, and he has doubt um, and and concern, and his family does. And we talk, and we communicate, and we battle, and we support, and we love, and and all those types of things. And now to see him playing the way he's playing, you know, um, making plays in the passing game, making plays in the running game as a blocker, uh, helping us, you know, win a uh, huge smile on his face, family, huge smiles on their faces. Um, you know, I just I'm a big believer in, in overcoming adversity and what it what it can do for you as a football player, but more importantly, what it does for you in life. Um, and I think he's a really good example of that. You know, um, the answer is is not to to you know leave when times get tough. 
Uh, the answer is to, to buckle down and, and get to work and communicate and have tough conversations and, and work through it. And, and that's, that's, what, that's what Nick did. That's what Nick did. That's what Nick's mom did. That's what Nick's dad did. His uncles who come to practice, his grandmom, all of them. And, and Nick did the work. And, you know, you talk about a guy that technically couldn't play for two whole years so to see this thing end the way it is for him uh, is awesome. He's still got a lot of football left to be played, but I couldn't be more proud of him. Uh, kid from Catanning, Pennsylvania. Uh, I remember the home visit. You know, he was committed to a, a, another school early in the process. And um, I remember the home visit. I remember going to visit his, his grandmom, who lived right down the street uh, from him. And... Um, it's just awesome you know it's awesome and then you got gonzalez is a highly recruited kid out of new jersey and you know like you said went from a, a third stringer to 41 consecutive starts had a sit down really tough conversation with him and his mom um and his uh, girlfriend and girlfriend's parents and uncle about last year about whether he should come out early or come back and school and what he wanted to do and what did he wanted to be a part of and tough conversation back and forth Th those are the things that I probably take with me and, and remember it's 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 meeting with Bowers's grandma and and him being in my office with injuries for two years and uh the emotion and the doubting themselves and questioning you know their role in the program and 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 then you get through all those things and same thing with gonzalez um you know and and him having to battle through some things and then you know 41 straight tar uh, 41 starts senior playing really well confident happy um, you know, just got invited to, to one of the, the senior all-star games to go show what he can do at the next level for the NFL. Um, you know, really pretty cool. I got a really close relationship with his high school coach as well, his, his high school offensive line coach who I talk to often, calls in and checks in with me. I, I would check, I would communicate with him with the winner's issues as well. So I, I think it's just really good stories about what college is supposed to be all about. It's supposed to be about ups and downs. It's supposed to be about, about being challenged academically. Uh, it's supposed to be about being challenged from a football perspective. It's making great friends. Um, it's maybe finding your wife. Uh, it's all of it. It's all of it. It's, it's the wins and, and the losses. Uh, um, had, they haven't had many of them late, lately, but, it, but it's still them. Um, so they're, two, they're just two really good examples, and that's kind of what I think about when I think about these guys. I don't think about the win, or I don't think about the touchdown, or I don't think about the Big Ten championship they, that they, that they uh, won. I think about the journey, you know, the entire journey that we've been through together. And it's pretty cool, and it's, it's probably what I love most about, about college football. When it comes to car buying, there's the other guy's way, and then there's the SMC way. The other guys force you into a vehicle you really don't want. The Subway Motors way lets you take the time you need to browse, ask questions, and take the test drive and think on it. For over 100 years, the Merth family and all their employees have made your experience the most pleasant one you'll ever have. The other guys won't offer you the best price for your trade, no matter how much they say they will. The SMC way is their promise to provide you with the most money the market shows your vehicle is worth. The SMC way is to offer you all applications applicable factory rebates on new vehicles and generous discounts. Looking for a pre-owned vehicle? The SMC Way checks each vehicle in a 200-mile radius to determine the lowest price, then beat it. It's the lowest price promise, just part of the SMC Way. The choice is up to you. The other guy's way or the SMC Way. The SMC Way wins every time. Sunbury Motors Company in the North 4th Street Auto Plaza, Sunbury, and at sunburymotors.com. Selling more cars and satisfying more customers for over 100 years. You're listening to News Radio 1070 WKOK Sunbury. You can hear us anywhere in the world with the Sunbury Broadcasting Corporation app. 